Hello and God bless you. This is Cassandra Hill from Mount Sinai Deliverance Missionary Baptist Church and I'm here today to present the Sunday School Lesson Overview for this week and this is lesson number nine um, for Sunday January 31st 2021 and we are teaching from the Union Gospel Press Christian Life Series. Before we go into our lesson today I would like to say hello to everyone who may be watching I pray that all is well with you and with your family. And I want to say a special hello to all the members and friends of Mount Sinai Deliverance Missionary Baptist Church. I want you to know that we are praying for you in our daily prayers and holding you up before the Lord. I pray that you had a blessed week and that you are ready for a brand new week and a new month. We will be going into a new month this week. So... We thank God for just bringing us through the first month of the year. And before we go on to our lesson today, uh, we want to bow our head in a word of prayer. We always want to acknowledge God and ask the Lord to be with us, especially when we're doing something for him. So at this time, let us bow our head in a word of prayer. Father God, in Jesus' name, Lord, we come to thank you. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to study your word. And Father, as we study today, we ask that you would open up our understanding, allow us to receive what you would have for us to receive today from your word. And Lord, we just thank you for everyone that is watching this video. Father, you know who everyone is and where everyone is. You know the needs that they may or may not have today, Lord, and we know that you are able to supply every need. So Father, we ask that you touch everyone that's listening to this video and watching this video, Lord, and touch their families, touch their households, Father. Father, if any are sick, we ask for your healing virtue to flow and touch them right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just ask if anybody needs a financial miracle or Lord, a spiritual miracle, emotional Whatever the need may be, Lord, we know you're able to do anything. So we ask that you touch right now in the name of Jesus, we pray. And we thank you for it in advance. Amen. Amen. Now, we're so glad again to be um, having another time to study God's word. And I hope you're ready to jump right in because we have a great lesson today. Um, so all this quarter... As you know, we've been studying the Gospel of John, and this is a book that's written by the Apostle John, which was one of Jesus' close disciples, um, one that was considered part of his inner circle, um, along with uh, Peter and James. Um, and we say it every week, and I like to say this just to kind of get us a foundation of where we're coming from with these lessons. But the purpose of John's gospel was to show that Jesus is the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God, which shows his deity, and he is the Savior of the world. So we need to keep that in mind as we're studying these lessons and see how each one of them are supporting John's purpose in writing the gospel. Now today, we are starting um, Unit 3 of this winter quarter. Uh, which covers the last five lessons that we will cover in this quarter. Now, just as a quick recap, um, to go back, Unit 1 covered the first four um, lessons, and it laid the foundation uh, for who Jesus is. And, of course, we said that that was the purpose of John writing the gospel so that we may know. Um, and John put it so eloquently and so well in the first chapter that, how Jesus was with God in the beginning and that all things that were made were made by him. So he was there in the creation and that um, not only was he with God, but he was God. So it shows his deity and that, and that he is one with God. Um, then in that unit, we studied uh, the testimony of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist related the sign that God had given him or how he would recognize the Messiah. And that would be that the uh, Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, would descend and fall on the Messiah and it would, would stay with him or would dwell with him. 
And John the Baptist witnessed this when he baptized Jesus. Not only did he witness that the, the spirit descend, but he also heard the voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And if you want to refresh your memory of that passage of scripture, you can look at um, Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. Now, in that unit, we also saw Jesus beginning his earthly ministry with the calling of his first disciples. Andrew and John were originally followers of John the Baptist, but once he made the declarations that Jesus was the Messiah, they began to follow Jesus. Um, um, uh, Andrew brought his brother Simon, which um, Jesus renamed Peter, and we know as Peter, um, to Jesus. And he began to follow Jesus. And then also we saw that Jesus called Philip and Nathaniel. And Nathaniel was also known as Bartholomew. Uh, so he called them and they began to follow him as well. And then we know that uh, we could check the other gospels for the calling of the other disciples. But Jesus was starting his earthly ministry. Well, that takes us to unit number two. And in and that unit, we studied two of Jesus' miracles. Uh, one of them was the um, miracle of Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And the other was um, Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee. Now, um, the water that was at the uh, wedding was uh, intended or could have been, was purposed to be used for, for cleansing. Um, the Jews practiced ceremonial cleansing um, where they cleansed themselves several times throughout the day, their hands and their feet, because they wanted to ensure that they were always clean. Now, Jesus replaced the water um, that was there with wine. And we know that the wine represents his blood, Jesus' blood which was shed for the remission of our sins. So we know that while they had water for outward cleaning, Jesus was um, pointing toward the time when he would shed his blood that would be for the inward cleaning and the remission of our sins. And that next lesson, we saw uh, the disciples in a boat crossing the Sea of Galilee when a storm or life-threatening storm arose on the sea. Now at the height of the storm and after the disciples had been battling all night long and it seemed like all could have been lost, um, they saw Jesus walking toward them on the sea. Now naturally that uh, frightened them because it's not natural for us as human beings to walk on water. But it was also a very frightening situation because they were battling for their lives. However, when Jesus got in the boat, the storm immediately ceased and they found themselves on the seashore. On They had crossed over safely. So uh, this showed Jesus has power over nature. He can calm the seas and the winds and the waves. But not only that, Jesus has the ability to carry us through the storms of our lives. So they had a natural storm, but we have storms that arise in our life and we can take comfort knowing that Jesus is able to carry us through. Then we continued on um, in lesson number seven where Jesus told the crowd that was following him, there was a crowd following him after he had performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000 men and women and children um, well, 5,000 men plus women and children with um, uh, two fish and five barley loaves. And they began to follow Jesus, but they were not following him for the right reasons. So Jesus told them not to strive for earthly food and miracles, but uh, to strive for spiritual food, food, spiritual food that would lead to everlasting life because uh, the earthly food is only going to satisfy you in the temporary uh so it's only temporal but jesus was instruct was um was admonishing them to strive for something eternal and everlasting and in that uh time jesus declared himself to be the bread of life and this was a metaphor that jesus was using to explain that he is the source of spiritual fulfillment and satisfaction 
and that whoever believes on him shall have everlasting life. Now Jesus continued the metaphor by saying that whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Now, and that song, that was found in John chapter 6 and verse 54. But now when Jesus said eat uh, his flesh and drink his blood, he meant that we must fully believe on him. And he ex explained um, earlier in that chapter that um, the work is believing on him. So it was not physically eating his body that it was talk that he was talking about. He was using a metaphor. But many of the uh, crowd, uh, the followers that were in the crowd, they were spiritually deaf. So they could not understand <laughs> what Jesus was talking about. And they thought he meant to literally eat him. <laughs> and uh, because of that, they they could no longer follow him. They, they couldn't follow him. That was too hard of a saying for him. But it's only because they, they didn't understand what he was saying. Um, so then at that point, Jesus turned and he asked his 12 disciples, would they also leave? And Peter replied for the group, and I want to read exactly what Peter said. Um, it was in chapter 6, uh, verses 68 and 69. And Peter said, uh, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. So Peter spoke up for the group. But what we found in this lesson is that we all have to make our own decision about Jesus. And everything that we encounter in the word of God is not going to be an easy saying and something that we can easily follow or easily take or accept. But we have to make our minds up on who Jesus is and trust him. If his word says something, it must be all right. It must be a meaning in there. Um, now, so this brings us to unit three and today's lesson. Now, today's lesson is entitled Jesus, the light of the world. And it comes from the text is taken from John chapter eight, verses 12 through 27. The related scriptures are John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, chapter 5, verses 19 through 30, chapter 12, verses 32 through 36, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. The time is 80, 29, and the place is Jerusalem. And the golden text reads, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that is taken from John chapter 8, verse 12. Now the aim of today's lesson is to learn what it means that Jesus is the light of the world. As believers, we have the light of Jesus to guide and sustain us in our daily lives. To practice walking in the light of Christ rather than in darkness. Now, our, our lesson today is broken into three sections as our outline shows. The first section is entitled The Light of the World, and that is taken from John chapter 8, verses 12 through 18. The second uh, section is entitled Blind to the Light, and that covers verses 19 through 22. And the third section is entitled Above and Beneath, and that is covers verses 23 through 27. Now let us begin our reading in the first section, covering verses 12 through 4, um, excuse me, covering in verses 12 through 18. Verse number 12 reads, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whether I go. 
but ye cannot tell whence I come and whether I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Amen, amen. Amen. So um, now let us take a look at uh, verse number 12 because it's really the, 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 the critical verse in our lesson and, and as such it's, it's, the, um, it's the golden text. So we spent a, a little time there um, and let's look at the setting of when this took place. Now at the beginning of chapter 12 it indicates that it, it was the beginning of a new day. So this is early in the morning in the beginning of a new day. And the Jewish people have completed uh, the observance of the Feast of Tabernacles. And we can read about the events that took place um, in, on, in chapter 7, in the previous chapter. So they're coming out of that celebration and it's a, a, the next day. It's a brand new day. Now, um, just a little bit about the Feast of Tabernacles. It's an annual feast that God had uh, commanded the children of Israel to observe to commemorate that God brought them or delivered them out of Egypt. And we know that they were in bondage and in slavery in Egypt, but God brought them out. He used Moses, but it was God's mighty hand that brought them out. And then after they came out of Egypt, they dwelled in the wilderness in booths or tents. And, and this is the celebration. So at, at during the time of this celebration, they would come out of their homes and they would dwell in tents. And um, now this is a, uh, a, a, a very important uh, uh, celebration, one of the feasts. And if you want to have more information on that, you can, uh, when God commanded this feast, you can take a look at Leviticus chapter 23 verses 34 through 43 and you can see that particular feast and in that chapter other feasts are mentioned as well but um during this particular feast there was a lighting ceremony that would take place and it, 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 it there were four huge menorahs um and we know those are the jewish candles uh and the the light from the menorah and the sun of the brand new day um, gives some context to Jesus' statement in this 12th verse. And so I'm going to read here some from um, the text, um, the Sunday School textbook. Um, it talks a little bit more detail about the, uh, um, the, the, the golden text. So let me read a little bit about that. It says, After the Feast of Tabernacles, the sun began to rise with the coming of a new day. Jesus makes another claim to deity in the temple. Now at this time he is in, actually in the temple speaking. He says, I am the light of the world. He that followed me shall never walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He compares himself to the sun, which gives light for the day. Since he was in the temple, he may also have had in mind the massive candelabrum, um, which the menorah I was mentioning, which remained lit at night. The Feast of Tabernacles was one of three pilgrimage festivals. Um, it lasted seven days in Jerusalem. So there, it, it started on the Sabbath, and it, at the end of the festival, there was a Sabbath. Um, but so you had the seven days. Amen. Um, four giant golden menorahs, each having six branches connected to one taller pillar in the center, protruded above the outside walls of the temple. So they were, when I say they were huge, they were so tall that they stood above the walls of the temple. The light is said to have illuminated the entire city. So they were so bright that they would in, in illuminate the whole city. 
So this is giving some um, the people some context of what Jesus is saying that he is the light. You know, we have the, the they had their menorah that was lighting the whole city during this festival, and then we saw the the sun that's lighting up the world. Amen. Amen. Or was lighting up the earth, I should say. Amen. Amen. But we know that Jesus is declaring himself to be the light of the whole world. Amen. Uh, it says the sun is both the center of our solar system and the primary source of all that lives on this planet. Without it, nothing on earth will survive. The earth would freeze in utter darkness. Jesus, the Son, is the essence of all life. Without a relationship with him, finite man dwells in infinite darkness. Without him, the entire ecosystem would be destroyed. Luke writes, for in him we live and move and have our being. And that's taken from Acts chapter 17 and 28. So we have to see the significance of who Jesus is. When he tells us his, he is the light of the world, without him, none of us would exist. Nothing would exist without him. And we could even go back to the beginning when he was with the Father. And it says nothing that was made was made without him. So the Lord Jesus is, is uh, he is the, uh, he enables us to exist and to be. So, you know, when we are in church or when we are even at home alone and we think about praising the Lord and we think about, you know, giving him uh, honor and glory, it's, 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 he, he deserves it. Because who would we be and what would we be without the Lord? And we're seeing that we would be nothing. Amen. We would be nothing without God. Amen. Amen. And goes on to read and says, um, well, let me go ahead and read this. It says, a lamp is designed to illuminate darkness. It can light up an entire room and give guidance. The Jewish lampstand, the menorah we're talking about, has a middle pillar that supplies oil to three shorter branches attached on each side. This points to Jesus as the main source of light. The attached branches represent a redeemed humanity who also spreads the light of Christ. Jesus is the light who gives the light of life to all who connected to him by faith. Let me read that again. Jesus is the light who gives the light of life to all who are connected to him by faith. Disconnected from him, man dwells in spiritual darkness. His soul is deprived and he has no ability to conceive the meaning and purpose of life, which is to worship, serve, and glorify Jesus Christ. So this is so important that we get a grasp on who Jesus is. And not only, um, we're not, you know, we're not just talking concerning people who may not know Jesus, you know, sinner, but even Christian people, even people that have grown up in the church and, and come to church on Sundays, they some people don't have a real uh, grasp of who the Lord is. And you may say, well, Sandy, how can you say that? Well, I'm saying that because whenever you could come to church and somebody has to just pump you and prime you to tell God thank you and tell the Lord Jesus thank you, and it's him, it's in him that we live and move and have our being, then you don't have a good understanding. You must not have a good understanding of who the Lord is. Because then you won't need you would need anybody to 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 prime you and pump you like that. You would just give you lift your hands and give him praise, honor, and glory just because of who he is and just because of what he's done for you and, and, and he's created you. And enabled you to do everything else. And sometimes people people put other things and other uh, relationships and other um, uh, things that they like to do above the Lord. But if it wasn't for the Lord, we wouldn't be able to do any of these things. 
So it's so important that Christians have a a good understanding, and as we even after we have accepted Christ as our Savior, that we haven't done it as just a um, I don't know, just as a perfunctory uh, uh, action, you know. But we have to really know who He is. Amen. Amen. And this is what these lessons are in John's gospel is pointing to who the Lord really is. Amen. So I want to spend just a little time on that um, that that verse number 12 because that's our central verse. That Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. Um, and that without him we are just we're in darkness. Amen. We're in spiritual darkness. A lot of people that have other religions and other um, uh, practices, spiritual practices that don't uh, include Jesus Christ. And Jesus is telling us without him we are in spiritual darkness. Amen. 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 So now uh, we look at the next verse. Verse number 13 it says, The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself thy record is not true so they rejected jesus claim of being the light of the world and they rejected it um using an old testament law um that could be found in deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 15 that basically says that you know a testimony has to be corroborated by two or three witnesses so if you're gonna make if jesus was to make this claim what they're saying you're making this claim who do you have to back you up? Or who is your witness to this claim? But you know, the thing is, Jesus, um, of course, had the Father as his witness. Amen. We, we, it, when we were talking about the lessons leading up to this, when we talked about how Jesus, uh, the Father spoke at Jesus' baptism. And this is my son in whom I'm well uh, pleased. But we also know that Jesus... That the Father gave Jesus this mission to come to earth anyway and, and to um, give himself as a sacrifice. So we know the Father is his witness. And, and maybe they couldn't see that because, you know, they, you know, looking at your physical, you can't see God. He's a spirit, right? But you know what? They also had the scriptures. Jesus uh, had the witness of the scriptures, the prophecies that had been spoken years and years of who of who the messiah would be what characteristics he would be the even how he would be born of a virgin and and the, there were different things that were prophesied about jesus that he fulfilled and the pharisees that he's speaking here with they should know this because they have the scriptures, and they they are astute and and, and and students of the scripture of the law, so they should know this. So that's one witness. Jesus also had the witness of the miracles that he performed. He performed so many miracles. Um, John did not uh, write about all of them, but we could see um, some of of the other ones in the other uh, gospels, uh, Matthew, Luke, and Mark. But even um, the, the Gospels said that they don't contain all the miracles that Jesus performed. So, but those people would they saw the miracles. They so they had the miracles as a witness. That was proof that this wasn't an ordinary man <laughs> that we're dealing with. It's something special about this man. Uh, and and one of the religious leaders, uh, Nicodemus, he came to Jesus in chapter uh, three of John. And he said, he let them know that we know that thou art a teacher come from God. So some of them knew, you know, maybe some didn't want to accept it. But some knew that no man could do these works that thou do except the Lord sent him. So, so some of them knew. So that was another witness. Um, so they had witnesses. They had proof of who Jesus um, is. And, but they didn't want to accept that. Okay, um, let me read something here um, from the book. It says, uh, The law specified that more than one witness was needed for a charge to be leveled. Christ's judgment was true in that he was not alone as a witness as they assumed. I, I, I pointed out just some of them. He and his father 
who had sent him to earth were in this together. Uh, uh, would have been in any way that Jesus could have performed the miracles that he performed had the Father not been with him. Uh, that their charge against him therefore had no validity whatsoever. He was a witness and his father was a witness. So their testimony was valid by there being two witnesses to his mission. So they, they had a witness, amen. They didn't want to accept it, but they did have a witness, amen, amen. So um, reading on, Jesus' response back to them was that uh, Jesus knew, well, verse 14, he was telling them he knew his origin. He knew where he had come from, and he knew where he was going, amen, and that's heaven. So they didn't know, but but he knew, amen. Uh, and uh, and he told them, and uh, uh, in verse fourteen, and um, he said, "But ye cannot tell whence I come and whether I go." Amen. So they they couldn't tell, uh, but but uh, but because they were spiritually deaf and didn't want to know. Amen. But Jesus knew. Amen. 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 Um, Jesus. Uh, continued on to say ye judge after the flesh I judge no man amen um, it, it was just their prejudice They it was after the flesh that they were judging they looked at Jesus where he came from and he didn't come um, it, they had uh, ideas of where the Messiah or how the Messiah would possibly enter the world and where he would come from and he would have all of these different earthly and physical at temporal attributes that, that Jesus was not fulfilling for them and uh, because of that they didn't want to accept him amen that it was their prejudice and their envy of the how Jesus um the people began to follow Jesus and began to walk with him um and, and they were envious of that and they let all these things keep them from seeing him for who he really is and who, and who he was and but but it was their own blindness and fueled by their prejudice and their envy but Jesus said and they they used all that as a judgment against him and but Jesus said what I judge no man in verse 15 that's what he said um and it reminds me so much of uh, chapter 3 of John when, uh, when John uh, uh, let me just read uh, what I'm referring to uh, uh, chapter 3 verse 16 and uh, 17 and we know we're very familiar with John 3 and 16 amen for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, um, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus, you know, he said, I, I judge no man. He didn't come to condemn the world. Jesus came that the world might be saved. Amen. Amen. And he says, I read a little bit more. 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. So your judgment is, is based on your belief. You know, if you don't believe, then you're condemned. But Jesus was telling him that wasn't the purpose that I came. You are judging me, but I didn't come to judge. I came to save. Amen. Amen. Okay, now I have another little reading here from the text. It says, while we tend to criticize the Pharisees for their lack of spiritual insight, we must face the fact that such ignorance is the norm for all humanity. Believers cannot comprehend spiritual truth. At the same time, many believers seem to have a very shallow perception of who Jesus is and what he did for our salvation. There is a great need for sound teaching in our churches today. And that's what we were talking about just a minute ago that um, we have to have an understanding. And these lessons, that's what they're designed 
to give us an understanding of who Jesus is. Amen. And once we understand who Jesus is, um, our perception, as the book said, we wouldn't have a shallow perception. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We would, we would, you know, just just following the Lord when everything is going well. Just following the Lord when when uh, I, you know, I got that job or that 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 thing I prayed for came on the time line when I wanted it to come, or you know, things like people. Uh, get hurt in the church or would somebody hurt my feelings in the church and you stop going to church you stop reading your bible you stop praying you stop your relationship with God and with the Lord Jesus because of something some man or some woman said to you and these people did not die for you they didn't uh, give their lives for you and Jesus gave his life for you so you can't let your relationship with the Lord Jesus be based on something so shallow. Because let me just say this, take a break from the lesson. Let's say this. Whenever you're dealing with people, whether it's in the church, whether it's on the job, whether it's in school, whether it's in the grocery store, wherever you're dealing with people, there's a chance that you might get there might be a misunderstanding. There might be some hurt. There might be something out, you know, that will happen, you know, because we are human and we are flesh. Amen. A lot of times we operate in our flesh. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We do. Amen. We do. Amen. And sometimes that causes us to hurt people. Amen. Sometimes, sometimes something is hurting us. Amen. And, and instead of us taking it to the Lord, we'll take it out on somebody else. Amen. But when that happens, we can't let things like that drive a wedge between us and the Lord. Amen. We have to forgive people. Amen. Sometimes we have to forgive ourselves. Sometimes we have to ask for forgiveness. Amen. Because sometimes we are the offended party. Amen. It happens. Amen. We're human and it happens. Amen. So we have to stop letting things like that drive us away from the Lord. Amen. I can't tell you how many people talk about church hurt. Amen. The church is full of people. Let us not forget that. You know, when we become saved, we don't become just angels and do everything just right. Amen. We make mistakes. And sometimes we have to say, I'm sorry. And sometimes we have to forgive people. Amen. Amen. Now, that was a little side note for my lesson. Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. But, amen. It's, uh, it's some good information. Amen. Amen. Because we don't want anything to come between us and our relationship with the Lord. And when we do, we let things come between our relationship, that means that we got to grow up a little bit. We have to get a little bit more mature in God. Amen. Amen. Okay, now it's time to look at our next section that covers uh, verses 19 through 22. Okay, and verse 19 says, Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him. For his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he said, Whether I go, ye cannot come. Amen, amen, amen. Look, amen. Um, they tried to insult Jesus. Uh, this question uh, was probably an, an, an insult because I'm sure they knew who Jesus was. They knew about Joseph. Amen. Amen. But there, this was an insult. Uh, 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 this was intended. That question was intended as an insult to the legitimacy of his birth. Amen. They know that there was some question about Jesus' birth. Amen. And they were just throwing that up as a, you know, as a distraction, which which happens a lot when when um, the truth is getting to us. We sometimes we we'll throw up something else to try to take the point, 
take the, uh, the, the, the focus off of what it is that's really at the heart of the matter. And that's what they did. They just kind of, because Jesus was referring to his father, his father that sent him, uh, bears witness of him. Well, who is your father? Amen. You know how, you know, that, 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 you know, people can get sometimes. Amen. So they was trying to, you know, insult Jesus. Amen. But, you know, if uh, Jesus was telling them, if you had known me, you should have known my father also. If they had an understanding of who Jesus is, they would know who his father is. Amen. They would know that he is the son of God. Amen. But they, they were, their hearts were hardened. Amen. And they didn't want to accept him and receive him as such. Amen. Now here's something I'm going to read here out of the text. It says, in the life. Jesus lived on earth. He manifested the full attributes of God. In all his actions and attitudes, it was obvious that he was not like other people. If the Jews had been observant, they would have recognized him for who he was. But they did not want to see it. As he taught in the temple, though there were many opposing him, no one made moves to arrest him. Now, this is an interesting point. Um, because um, earlier in the scripture, even before the Feast of Tabernacles, some of the brethren were telling Jesus to come to the feast, and Jesus did not come with them at that time. Um, he came along later, amen, because Jesus knew that uh, if they could get their hands on him, <laughs> they wanted to arrest him. And even um, in chapter 7, they had asked, why, why didn't you arrest him? Amen. But Jesus was uh, speaking him not in the temple freely, you know, and they could not bother him. Uh, it says, because it was not yet his time, he was fully protected by the Father. Now, you know, that should give us some consolation there that how Jesus was in the midst of his enemies and they definitely wanted to harm him. Uh, they wanted to arrest him and we know that ultimately Jesus was crucified, so they wanted to, to harm the Lord, but they couldn't. They couldn't lay hands on him, amen, even though he was right in their midst because our book was saying he was fully protected by, by the Father because his time was not yet come. So we could take comfort in this knowing that the Lord, Father God, is a protector of his people, amen, and, and, and um, this should build uh, some faith and some confidence that Jesus walked right in the midst of them and they couldn't bother him. Amen. They couldn't touch him. Amen. Because the Lord God still had plans for him. Amen. So hopefully that, that will give some consolation to somebody that may be fearful today. That may be worried about something today. Um, you just pray and, and you stay in the Father's hand. Amen. He has his hands on you. Amen. And nothing can harm you. Amen. Amen. When the Father has you in his hand, amen, it all is going to work together for his good. So he does not want us to be fearful, amen, amen. But as we continue to read, uh, uh, they said, uh, Jesus said uh, again unto them, I go my way and ye shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, he cannot come. Now, you know, when I read that verse 21, I thought about when Jesus was talking with his disciples. Um, I believe uh, it's the 14th chapter, St. John, let not your heart be troubled. And he began to tell me he's going away, right? But he said he was going away to prepare a place for them that where he is, they may come also, right? Uh, uh, so, so the Lord wanted... It's not that he didn't want people to come or that Jesus was you know, telling them, you can't come. It's his desire for them to come, but it was because of their unbelief that they could not come. Amen. I want to uh, make that uh, that plain because we see in a, in a few chapters uh, over that Jesus was telling the disciples, I'm going away and where I'm going, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And where I'm going, you're going to come. I'm, you're going to come and, and I'm going to receive you. Amen. So Jesus is not barring anybody from heaven, but they're going to die in their sins because of their lack of belief. Let us know that the only way to heaven is we have to believe. Jesus is our bridge, amen, to the Father, amen. So, so we can try other means and other methods, but Jesus is telling you, I am the way. 
Amen. Amen. And there's another scripture where he is going to say that uh, point blank and specifically. Amen. But he's letting us know. So you can trust in these other things, but I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Amen. Jesus letting you know that without him, you're not going to make it. Amen. So, um, 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 it's a good thing right now while you have your faculties to make a decision for the Lord. Amen. Because some people never do. And they just, you know, you we, we don't know, right? So make a choice while you have a chance and, and accept the Lord today. So there'll be no doubt. Amen. Amen. Now, verse 22 says, then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he said, whether I go, ye cannot come. So they thought that Jesus was um, contemplating suicide. <laughs> Amen. They didn't know. They were still thinking earthly. Amen. But Jesus was speaking spiritual truths. Amen. He was not speaking of the earth. Amen. Because they were thinking, where, where can he go on the earth that we can't find him? He must be talking about killing himself. Amen. That just shows you how far off they were. Amen. But you know what? This also, we can take comfort in that Jesus knows how we feel when we, uh, when people dismiss us, when we're trying to tell them about the Lord. Amen. Some of you have loved ones and friends, family members, you've been trying to tell them about the Lord and they just shoo you off and you almost want to give up on them and give up hope, but don't give up on them. The Lord knows how you feel because he, he's in this situation where he's trying to tell. Now, these people that he's talking to are the religious leaders. They should know. They have the scriptures and he can't convince them. Amen. Amen. So, look, if Jesus couldn't convince people, you can't convince people either. But you can tell them. You can let them know and let the Holy Spirit convict their hearts. That's where what our job is. We are to tell people. And we pray the Holy Spirit will convict their hearts and draw them in. Amen. But he, he knows how it feels sometimes, how disappointing it feels when you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus and they're rejecting you and they're dismissing what you're saying. You know, um, the Lord knows how we feel. Okay, uh, let me read here. Um, a, a reading here from the book. It says, he was warning them of the disastrous consequences of not believing in him. His time on earth was growing short, but their opportunity to believe in him was also growing short. And their refusal would result in eternal separation from God. The message was not only urgent for them, but also challenges us today. The truth is that anyone who dies without Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior dies in their sin and without hope of e entering heaven. There is no more important decision any of us can make than trusting in Jesus. Our eternal destination is at stake. And that's why I encourage you don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your friends that you're talking to about the Lord. It, this is their eternal um, destination. Amen. The life that we live on, we, we, you know, we, we hear of some people living in their 90s and, and uh, past 100. Amen. I had an aunt that lived past 100. Amen. Um, but what is 100 years compared to eternity? Amen. So, so this is very important. It's the most important thing, Amen. And and, and um, so don't don't stop praying for your family and friends that seem uninterested and unconcerned about their eternal destination, Amen. Because this is really important, Amen. Jesus was not going to kill himself, though he was going to give his life for us. We must understand the the um the difference. He died willingly in payment for our sins. And the only way we can be with him and his father after this life is to repent of our sins and trust in him as our Lord and Savior. This is so important, um, family uh, and friends that I'm speaking to. This is so important that if you haven't um, trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior, it's so important that you do that. Amen. 
because tomorrow is not promised to any of us. And I mean, young people are leaving here as well as uh, seniors. Amen. Sometimes it looks like the young people are leaving almost as fast as the seniors. Amen. So we can't say, well, I'll do it tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So if you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to do that. Amen. Amen. For your own eternal salvation. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, now we're moving on to our last section, which covers verses uh, 23 through 27. And it reads, And he said unto them, Ye are not from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. If, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Amen, amen. So Jesus was letting them know that his origin was Father God. He came from God the Father, amen. And their origin and our origin too is fallen human nature. Amen. We come from human nature. That's why we have to repent of our sins and accept the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, as the Savior and as the one who paid the penalty for our sin, amen, amen. Jesus is our only way to the Father, amen. Jesus is telling us that he is the only way, amen, and that is why um, they would die in their sins if they didn't believe on him, amen. There is no other way. Je I'm just telling you what Jesus said. It's up to you. Here in this video, you know, whether you believe or not, amen, is up to you. I'm telling you what the scripture says and what Jesus said, amen. And it's it it's kind of sad because we there are so many people that pass on and leave this life and they've never given their lives to the Lord, but they expect that they're going to heaven or they expect that they're going to be an angel and they expect all these things, but how how is this possible you know if you've never even spent any time with god or acknowledged god or acknowledged his son amen that's what you really have to do you have some people want to acknowledge god but they don't want to acknowledge jesus and jesus is telling you you must acknowledge me amen you must repent of your sin and you must accept what i've done because i was the only one I was the only man that was sinless that could be a sacrifice for the sin. And that's what the Father required. Amen. The Father required not for salvation that I'm talking about. Not our good works and not our burning sacrifices and all of that. You know, that was for a time. You know, that was God accepted that for a time. But since God has sent his son, now that's not what he's looking for. He's not looking for us to make animal sacrifices because he sent his son, which is the ultimate sacrifice, amen, for our sins. So uh, all what we have to do now is to believe. And uh, it, it kind of reminds me of, of the, the uh, lesson a couple weeks ago where the people were asking, well, what works do we have to do? People... It seems like people would prefer to let what I have, what work they want to work it out, amen. And the Jesus told them the work is to believe, amen, to believe on me, amen, amen. So that's what it's all about, believing on Jesus. That's what He wants us to do, amen, to do today, amen. And that way, if we do it the way the Lord tells us, we will have that assurance, amen. When we die, where where is our soul? going to rest in eternity amen amen we'll know because jesus is the only one that's been to heaven and came back to tell us about it amen amen and left a record of it amen so amen this is what he's telling us today amen okay i'm reading more out of the text it says uh this truth is so important 
that Jesus used the phrase shall die in your sins three times, once in verse 21 and twice in verse 24. To die in your sins means to die with the burden of one's own sin and its penalty enforced by a righteous God. Amen. And that's, um, they took a uh, reference from Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Physical death separates the spirit from the body. Now that, that's physical death. Spirit of man leaves his body. Amen. Spiritual death separates the spirit from God. Amen. And that's quoted from home and New Testament commentary. Amen. So think about it. To be spiritually separated from God forever. Amen. Uh, once that final separation occurs. There is no second chance. Amen. This is serious. This is serious. There's no second chance. So, so um, you want to uh, make sure that you accept Jesus Christ. Amen. It says, the raw truth is that if they rejected him, they would suffer eternal separation from God in hell. Jesus is the only hope for anyone to gain heaven. Amen. And 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 a lot of people don't want to accept it, but I'm just telling you what the Lord says. Amen. Amen. And he knows because he's like I said, he's the one that went to heaven and came from heaven. Amen. And he gave us the signs um that that he was of God by the words that he spake and the miracles that he performed. Amen. And he fulfilled the prophecies that were made of him. Amen. So we can have faith that he is the Messiah. Amen. Uh, the only begotten son of God. Amen. 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 Now in verse 25. They said unto him. Who art thou? So they asked tauntingly. Well, who are you? Amen. <laughs> Amen. They didn't want to accept him. Amen. As if to say. Who are you? That we should believe in you. Well, we should believe what you're saying. Amen. Amen. They didn't have any desire for the true answer. Their hearts were so hardened. Amen. And Jesus replied uh, uh, that uh, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I'm the same. I'm t I already told you who I am. Amen. Jesus had given them enough information. Amen. And they already had enough information to know who he is. And sometimes, you know, you talk to people about the Lord. They tell you, I know I need to get saved. I know I need to get right. They already know. Amen. But they have a hindrance. Amen. That's why we have to pray for our families and pray for our friends. Some people even want to come to Jesus, but they just, they're afraid that they have to give up so much. Amen. That they, they just, you know, they just don't want to do it. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, amen. Um, if it, it, it's nothing worth having uh, that, that's going to cause you to lose uh, your soul and, and, and go to hell. Amen. There's nothing on this earth worth having. Amen. No car, no house, no girlfriend, no boyfriend. Amen. It's not worth, amen, you losing your soul for eternity. Amen. Amen. Nothing is worth that. The Bible says, what, uh, what shall profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Amen. Amen. So there's nothing worth losing your soul over. Amen. Okay. Let me see here. We got another little reading here. It says, um, uh, what really infuriated them was his application of the phrase I am to himself in verse 24. Okay. So in verse 24, he said, I said unto you, then, um, ye shall uh, die in your sins for if ye believe not that I am he. Now the, 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 the Sunday school text explains that the word he was added by the King, J King James Version translators. Amen. So we know that the word of God is a translated book. It wasn't written in English. It was translated into English. And they added this word I am he. Um, but originally it said that I am. Amen. And we know that I am is the name that Moses told um, that God told Moses that he was when Moses said 
he said to God was sending him to the people to lead them out of uh, slavery in Egypt. When we mentioned that at the top of the lesson, amen. He asked the Lord, he asked God, who am I to say that sent me? And God said, tell him that I am. <laughs> so they were very familiar with I am, that, that the name I am. And they were infuriated that Jesus was using that name. But Jesus was using that name. To tell them that I am God. <laughs> Amen. Like John said in the beginning, I was he was with God and he was God. Amen. That they two operate in, in uh sync with one another. Amen. Contrary to what they had excuse, accused him of earlier, his own testimony about himself was indeed true. From the beginning, he had been presenting himself as the Messiah. This message had originated with his father. He that he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And that's um, verse 26. Jesus had much more to say to everybody. Anything he had to say was the truth because it came from his father. And he was saying nothing other than than what had come from that source is similar to today we're reading the lesson and we're just we're telling you i'm telling you what jesus is saying amen i'm not telling you my thoughts and my theory and what i think about it. i'm telling you jesus said amen and jesus was telling what the father said amen the jews never did fully understand that christ was in truth one with the father indeed they they soon charged him with blasphemy making for making that claim amen so they never did accept jesus amen jesus christ is the light of the world those who cannot see his light are in a realm of darkness which is in satan's domain and here's some scripture references second corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 and Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2. But John gives us plenty of reason to hope in the light that Jesus offers for eternal salvation. Amen. 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 So I hope that you have gotten some out of this lesson. Amen. This is a very powerful and important lesson. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go right now to our practical points. And practical point number one says the salvation Jesus Christ offers transfers people from the path of sin to a path of righteousness. And that's coming from John chapter 8 verse 12. Number two says every word of Jesus is true and confirmed by God the Father. No argument of man can change that. And that is from verses 13 through 18. Number three, to know Jesus is to know God. For Jesus is God. And that's coming from verse 19. Number four says, because of sin, all unbelievers are separated from God and deserve eternal judgment in hell. And that's coming from John chapter 8 verses 20 through 24. And for a reference, you can see Luke chapter 13, verses 22 through 30. Number five says, we can speak the truth about Jesus, but we cannot make people understand it. That is the work of God. And that's coming from John chapter 8, verses 25 through 27. Now we have listed there some questions for research and discussion. I always say that we can take these questions and then maybe take a deeper dive in the lesson to see what God has for us. I think that would be so beneficial for us to do since this is such an important lesson today, I tell you. And then now we have next week's lesson, which is entitled Jesus' Claim to Deity. And the lesson is taken from John chapter 8, verses 48 through 59. 
So we're going to stay in chapter 8 for a minute. And we have our related scriptures. Um, Exodus chapter 3 verses 13 through 15. John chapter 5 verses 31 through 37. And we have John again, chapter 7, 16 through 18, and verses 28 through 29 from chapter 7 of John. And Revelations, chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Amen, amen. This is such a powerful lesson today. Jesus is the light of the world. And when we don't accept Jesus, we really are walking in spiritual darkness. Now that's whether you have, um, whether you're following another spiritual practice or not. If you have not accepted Jesus, if you repented of your sin, accepted Jesus Christ, then we are in spiritual darkness. And if you have not accepted Jesus, I hope that these lessons have pricked your heart and have brought you to a place where you are ready to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's not a difficult thing to do. The Bible makes it so clear that if we repent of our sins, if we believe in our heart that Jesus died and that the Father rose him up, that he rose again he, um, from the dead, and if we can confess that with our mouth, the Bible said we're saved. So we have to believe it in our heart, amen, who Jesus is, that Jesus is who he said he is, and that he died for our sins, that he rose, amen, and if we can confess that, amen, then we are saved, amen, and, and along with repenting of our sins, amen, it's not hard, you can say something simple as, Lord, I'm sorry for the things that I have done that was not like you. And Lord, I believe you're the Son of God and that you died for my sins. And I accept what you did when dying for my sins and rising. And Lord, I invite you to come into my heart right now and be my Lord and Savior. And if you believe that, if you really believe that and you said those words, then you are born again. You're saved. Now what you have to do is you have to get your Bible. Amen. And get you go find you a Bible believing, Bible teaching church. And you are more than welcome to continue um, studying the Sunday school lessons as you are finding your church. Maybe Mount Sinai would be your church. Mount Sinai is located in Chicago, Illinois, 9900 South Luella Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. We're not having services right now due to the pandemic amen but we're reaching out through the sunday school lessons right now and we are looking forward to the time when we will be able to resume and then there mount sinai is not the only church i don't know where you're located but i'm sure with uh just some seeking and praying and asking god to lead you you can find a church that is uh available to you as close to you amen even there are many churches that are offering online worship services right now, um, while, and some are meeting, amen, right along now. But the important thing is to find a church where they are teaching the word of God, amen, amen, and they can, we, you can be further instructed. But like I said, you're certainly welcome to continue to um, watch and view the videos, the Sunday school videos that we are producing here at Mount Sinai Baptist Church. And I will also ask you to um, share them with your friends. Share them with your family members. Maybe if, if they're looking for uh, Sunday school lessons. Uh, um, we are, again, this is the Union Gospel Press lesson that's being followed right now. Uh, and certainly would love for uh, these lessons to go to anyone that uh, would find them to be beneficial. So, um I hope that you said the prayer and invited the Lord in your life. And if you already say, I hope that you're holding on to God, staying strong, standing on his word, believing and knowing that the Lord is bringing us through this time and, and this world that we're in right now. He hasn't forsaken us. He hasn't left us. He's still on our side. And keep your trust in the Lord. 
Now you have your lesson uh, for next week. I, I just showed it there on the screen. I hope that you will take that uh, note of that and study your Sunday school lesson. Uh, keep studying the Word of God and meet me next time here for another Sunday school lesson overview. God bless you and have a blessed week.